Okay, in chapter 12, we're going to take a look at creating and pricing products that satisfy customers. As a means of an introduction, what is a product? Everything one receives in exchange, including all tangible and intangible attributes and experience benefits, maybe a good or a service or an idea. So what's the difference between a good and a service? Well, a good is a is a tangible item. Uh, it's like walking into a bakery and buying a cookie. That's something that's real. It's a physical thing you can touch. A service is a result of, uh, you know, some sort of mechanical effort or human skill. Um, to a person or a thing. So that's like a barber giving you a haircut. They don't give you new hair, they just cut your existing hair. It's like a plumber fixing your toilet. You don't buy a new plump, you know, excuse me, you don't buy a new toilet, but the plumber maybe unclogs the drain. Um, so uh, lastly, an idea um, could be a philosophy, a lesson, a concept, and advice. Um, this is kind of a gray area between service and idea. So like, for example, my daughter takes piano lessons. Um, that's a lesson. Um, it's an idea about how to play a piano, but I look at it as part of a service. So generally speaking, things can be broken down into two categories, goods and services. Now, um, how we classify products matters. So in general, they can be put into two categories. Um, the first is a consumer product, which is a product purchased to satisfy personal or family needs. That's something we're all pretty familiar with. Um, Basically, anything you go to the store for is a consumer product. Um, the other type of category is a business product. It's a product that's bought for resale. So um, uh, it can be an input into another product or part of a firm's operations. Um, a business product would be um, like lumber for a uh, contractor who's going to build you a house. Um, or uh, a business goes to Costco and buys um, meat that they're going to make hamburgers out of. You buy the hamburger as a consumer product, but the meat going in is an input for, um, for uh, resale. Now, um, within the first category, the consumer products, uh, there's some classifications. So this gets a little bit thick, but don't worry. Um, just pick a part of it in the reflection paper and run with it. Um, or not. Just pick something out of the chapter. Um, so there are three categories of consumer products. Convenience products, which are pretty inexpensive and bought a lot. Um, doesn't really, you know, take much brain power to do it. Yeah, go get a loaf of bread, a gallon of gas, buy a newspaper, that type of thing. Those are convenience products. Um, <clears throat> shopping products are an item for which buyers are willing to expend considerable effort on planning to buy and making a purchase. So that's like if you're going to Lowe's or Home Depot to buy a new fridge. You've probably done a little bit of research. Same thing with like mobile phones. Now, um, specialty products are the third type. So you've got convenience product, shopping product, something you're going to shop around for, and specialty product, um, which is an item that possesses one or more unique characteristics um, that has a significant group of buyers. They're willing to expend considerable purchasing. So you're talking about like artwork, buying a fancy car, that type of thing. That's a specialty product. So for the most part, we we're, we dwell um, very heavily in convenience products and shopping products. Um, and every now and then we dabble in specialty products. Now, um, when we switch to the other category and look at business product classifications, um, they can be classified in several ways. There's uh, two slides here. It's going to be kind of a long list. Uh, the first type is uh, first category within a business product is raw material. So basic material that becomes a part of a physical product, you know, something in mining, um, you know, something that's taken from the ground, um, uh, something that's harvested from a forest or an ocean or, you know, it's a recycled product. It's literally raw materials, a raw plastic that you recycle um, and make something out of um, would be an example. So major equipment, that's big capital, uh, physical capital there. Uh, large tools and machines used for production like a crane or some sort of manufacturing machines. They call it stamping machines. So something can be, um, takes raw metal, raw iron and turns it into something that um, can be used. So you also have accessory equipment. Um, it's pretty standard as equipment used in the production or office activities. Things like hand tools, photocopies, calculators, that type of thing. Um, component parts, an item that becomes a part of a physical product. Uh, 
It could be either a finished item uh, for assembly or a product that needs a little more processing. Um, classic example there, inputs for like BMW would be tires or inputs for like Intel would be computer chips. Continuing um, the different types of uh, uh, business products um, category or yeah, categories. Uh, process material is material that's used directly in the production of another product but is not readily identified. Think of something like uh, food preservatives um, when they're you know making Marie calendar um, dessert or or a lasagna or something that's food preservative. Um, glue that holds things together, that type of thing. Um, there can be a category of business products called supply. It's an item that facilitates production and operations, but does not become part of a finished product. So um, office supplies, paper, pencils, that type of thing. Um, <clears throat> and then lastly, business services. So it's an intangible product that an organization uses in its operations. So um, if you're running an office, um, you might have a legal um, counsel or a CPA who helps you with your financial services, helps you with your taxes, that type of thing. Now, jumping over to product life cycles. Product life cycles is a series of stages in which a product's sales, revenue, and profit increase, reach a peak, and then decline. Um, so just like uh, humans and other animals, um, products have a life cycle. Um, this graph helps explain it a little bit better. Basically, you have four main areas. You have an introduction, you have growth, maturity, and decline. So if you look at an industry, let's look at this. It has, you know, the, the growth, a peak, a decline, um, and then ultimately, you think they might have a product death somewhere out here, which is just replaced by something. So, um, an industry, so you have sales volume, but just keep in mind, sales revenue is not profit. Um, sales revenue, uh, profit is total revenue minus total cost. So, this is just a total revenue. So, you got sales revenue volume here. It's peaked up here. Um, the difference here would be cost, and this would be your profit. So, it follows a introduction, growth, maturity, decline, life cycle. So the stages of a life cycle, uh, there are four. Uh, again, the introduction is where uh, customer awareness and acceptance of new products really low. Um, you may have some early adopters, but the bulk of the market doesn't really know what's going on there. So um, sales may rise gradually um, as you promote and distribute. Um, there's really no competitors. This is early in a market and there's high development marketing costs result in low profit or even um, a loss initially. So you think about a lot of businesses when they start, they have a lot of startup costs. They have to buy land, they have to build a building, they have to hire new people, train everybody. And that's all before they produce the first good or service. So um, very, very common for businesses not to make money right up front. Uh, that's the introduction stage. So then they have growth and that's that upward trend that we saw a second ago. Um, sales increase rapidly. We have that great uh, increase in awareness of product. Uh, other firms like, hey, shoot, let's jump in there. So competition emerges. Um, with competition, you also have to work on cutting your cost to have a lower price. Um, and as you become more efficient, you can up your profit per unit. So um, industry profits eventually will peak and then begin to decline right after the growth uh, stage. So um, this is the big part where you want to build some some uh, brand loyalty among your customers for repeat business. So um, stage three. Um, so we had introduction and growth, and now we're looking at maturity. Um, maturity is when sales are still increasing at the beginning of the stage, but they start to, to start to slow. So they increase at a decreasing rate, and eventually they peak and begin to decline. Um, along with the industry-wide profits. So your individual company's profits peak and decline and um, the profits start to, you know, tail off there. So um, the weaker competitors, the ones that were just dabbling, they leave the markets, they're not as hardcore. Um, <clears throat> marketers introduce refinements and extension of original product to the market to try to extend that growth stage. So... Um, uh, this is actually a typo here. Um, in number four, they say growth here. It's actually a typo. We're going to go back and fix that. This should say decline. So let's fix that right now. So the fourth stage is not growth. Um, first stage is introduction, followed by second stage of growth. Third stage is maturity. And then fourth is decline, where the sales volume decreases sharply and profits continue to fall. A number of competitors are getting out. Um, 
And the only survivors in the marketplace are firms that are specialized in that market, meaning they can't do other things. Um, wise companies at this point pivot or find a new use for their good, um, and they move into another industry. So production and marketing costs become most important to determine their profits. So if it's if you're in an industry that's in decline, but you are a low-cost low leader, you can still um, make some money, but it's not an ideal situation. So... Uh, product line and product mix, what are, what are those two things? So a product line, let's start there, is a group of similar products that differ only in relatively uh, minor characteristics. The classic examples, Procter & Gamble, you'll see a P&G. Um, take a look at your toothpaste tonight. Uh, manufacturers market several shampoos. I mean, look at, look at everything. Procter & Gamble is all over your um, bathroom medicine cabinet. So they have things like uh, Pantene, Head & Shoulders, Ivory, um, Again, a lot of them uh, make toothpaste, that type of thing. Um, that's a product line. Uh, product mix is all the products a firm offers for sale. So mix can be like a lot of different things. So uh, two dimensions are um, often applied to a firm's product mix. First of all, it's the width of the mix is the number of product lines it contains. So how deep is your bench, if you will. And the depth of the mix is the average number of individual projects within, within each line. So you might have a product line um, like Procter & Gamble. Um, that has a wide array of different things, but um, their depth um, is really into the personal hygiene, um, toothpaste, uh, shampoo, um, soap, um, so on and so forth. Procter & Gamble is very deep in the personal hygiene um, product mix. So, uh, managing existing products. Uh, sometimes you have to have product modifications, the process of changing one or more of your product's characteristics. Um, that's very, very important when you start to slow down your growth and revenues. Um, and you, you're trying to avoid the peak and the decline. So, um, an existing uh, example there is Panera reformulated soups that avoid um, artificial ingredients, uh, Panera bread. Um, it's a French word for spend thirteen dollars and be hungry in forty five minutes, in my opinion. But um, they do have some pretty good soups that don't taste like you know Campbell's. They're they're pretty good. So um, that's one way they modified their products very early on to differentiate themselves. So um, existing products can be modified in three ways. In general, you can have quality modifications, changes in the real. Um, uh, that relate to the product's dependability, durability, and, and usually achieved by alterations in materials and product production process. That was the Panera soup approach. Um, higher quality soup um, differentiated themselves. Um, they can have functional modifications that affects the product's versatility, effectiveness, convenience, safety, and usually requires a redesign of the product. Um, so basically, that's what the product does. The classic example there is Pfizer Pharmaceuticals with Viagra. Uh, Viagra actually started out as a heart pill um, to help uh, blood flow uh, to and from the heart. Um, and they found a little side effect, in particular their male patients, and they quickly pivoted, uh, made a functional modification to Viagra. And it became the product that we all know it as today, um, which is an erectile defun uh, dysfunction um, drug. Um, had this been a normal lecture, I'd tell you about the story of the time when I was a pharmaceutical rep with GlaxoSmithKline. I was selling a product called Nasacort. At the time, it was um, prescription. Now you can buy it over the counter. Anyway, the packaging looked very similar to Viagra, and I once got chased through a uh, parking garage in, near Sumter Hospital because the guy thought I had a bag full of Viagra. Um, Needless to say, I'm not sure why I ran, but I was kind of afraid, like if you found me and I only had allergy medicine, what might happen. So, um, yeah, that happened. That was a functional modification, um, not being me being chased, but Viagra moving from a heart pill to um, an ED, ED med medication. So um, there can also, thirdly, can be aesthetic modifications. That's a change in the sensory appeal of a product um, by altering its taste, texture, sound, smell, um, basically rebranding, um, like how does it make the end user feel? Um, so um, you know, that that can 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 really affect, say, a restaurant's feel. Uh, if it feels more like a greasy spoon. It's not a place for a date night. Um, but if they throw in some booze and change the aesthetics to the restaurant, it becomes more of a date night type space. Um, 
so you have product mod uh, modification basically in three ways. Now, moving on to uh, line extension, development of a new product that is closely related to one or more products in the existing product line, but is designed specifically to meet somewhat different customer needs. And examples, uh, Arby's came out with sliders, miniature versions of its sandwiches. Um, but I know some of y'all only like the bread, so there you go. Um, so those curly fries there. Um, basically taking what you already produce and finding a new way of doing it. So Chick-fil-A going for the, not only the chicken sandwich, but the spicy chicken sandwich. And then uh, McDonald's um, offering breakfast all day. All those things are line extensions. Sometimes you have to delete products. Um, that's to maintain the effect of product mix. An organization often has to eliminate some products. Product deletion is elimination of one or more products from a product line. Um, this could be because it's weak and unprofitable product um, that costs the company time, money, resources, etc. Um, so weak products on favorable image can negatively impact customer perception and sales of the products by the firm. Um, I always think about when we talk about product deletion, um, there's sometimes selective deletion. I always think about McDonald's and the McRib sandwich. Um, when it first came out, I, I fully believe that they intended to keep it on the menu all the time. But while it was popular to start, um, it really tailed off. And so now they found a way to um, make it seem like a scarce um product by saying, hey, the McRib is back, but it's going to be only here for a limited time. So that makes people go out and get it while it's available. Uh, it's kind of funny way of uh, using product deletion to actually increase demand. Um, so companies always have to be looking at developing new products um, and introducing new products. Um, it can be very time consuming, expensive, expensive and risky. Uh, most firms um, know that right out of the gate, 50% failure rate on new products. Um, some of them are just not going to work. Um, this is a condensed slide set, but it went through like a bunch of products that failed. Uh, Barnes & Noble's Nook. Uh, Coke back in the day came out with something called New Coke. It was terrible. Um, we can all think of something that came out that just was like, what were they thinking? So that's about a 50-50 proposition. So new products are generally grouped into three categories on the basis of the degree of similarity to the existing product. Is it imitation products designed to compete with an existing products of other firms? We see all the time firms uh, imitate each other. Uh, recently uh, had Chick-fil-A versus Popeye's um, chicken. A lot of imitation going back and forth with the chicken sandwiches. Um, you can have adaptations. That's variations of existing products that are intended for an established market. So uh, take an existing product and adapt it to a new use or uh, a new spin, that type of thing. Um, and then you have innovation. It's a completely new product. It just comes out and like, wow, this is something completely new um, and fresh. Um, but again, they still have about a 50-50 shot. So the process of developing a new product uh, consists of seven phases. And I'm going to let you guys read about that um, in the textbook. Um, I've actually cut that slide out. Um, I wanted to jump to branding. Um, what is branding? It's a name, a term, a symbol, a design, or in combination of those things that identify a seller's product as distinct from those um, so other sellers. So we all know um, like the Apple brand, Nike, that type of thing. So brand name is part of the brand that can be spoken. Um, uh, you can kind of, you know, the, the brand mark is the big one with the Nike swoosh is a part of a brand that's symbolic or distinctive. The brand name, the thing that's spoken, Nike, just do it. I mean, their, their motto just rolls right out. Um, so that's part of their brand name. And the brand mark is the, Ni uh, the Nike swoosh, a little check mark. Trademark is a brand name or brand mark that's registered with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Offices and thus is legally protected from uh, use by anyone except its owner. So like Reebok can't come out with like a Nike swoosh. Um, that would be some serious legal issues there because they have the U.S. PTO office um, um, has given them a trademark. So trade name, complete and legal name of the organization. Uh, to protect your brand, you're going to need a trademark and a trade name. Now, types of brands continue. Um, here, manufacturer or producer brands, a brand that's owned by a manufacturer. Um, there's a lot of this on the cereal aisle. Think Kellogg's um, Frosted Flakes. That's a brand name. Uh, Kellogg's Frosted Flakes. So major appliances like Whirlpool, um, ExxonMobil Gas, um, Honda, 
Toyota, clothing, Levi's. They're sold as manufacturer brands. That's the companies that manufacture it, and that is their brand. Store or private brand, a brand that is owned by an individual wholesaler, a uh, retailer. When Sears was still kicking, they, every their, one of their appliances were called Kenmore. Um, if you've ever been to Costco, you've got Kirkland. Um, you can go, you know, to... to uh, whatever your store is, um, Sam's Club, wherever, and they're going to have their own store or private brand. Um, generic product or generic brands, a product with no brand at all. This is those, uh, if you ever see the meme on Facebook or something, you always have like the knockoffs of Dr. Pepper. Um, my personal favorite back in the day was from Kmart, and they had Dr. Thunder. That stuff was on point. Almost tasted just like uh, Dr. Pepper, but that was Kmart's version. It wasn't really a store brand because they didn't control it, but it was a generic product knockoff of uh, Dr. Pepper, Dr. Thunder. Man, I miss that stuff. Um, benefits of branding. You, get, you can build brand loyalties to the extent to which a cons uh, customer is favorable or feels favorable towards buying a specific brand. Uh, three levels of brand loyalty. They, they have brand recognition, brand preference, brand insistence. Um, brand recognition, we all kind of recognize, you know, the major players in the laptop. We might have a preference for a Mac or a PC, um, you know, Dell or whatever, um, but we might insist on having an Apple. So that's brand insistence. So brand equity is marketing and financial value associated with brand strength and market. Um, there are four major factors that uh, contribute to brand equity, and they are brand awareness, brand association, perceived brand quality, and brand loyalty. Um, I kind of feel like this about Toyota. Uh, I have a Toyota truck. My wife has a Toyota uh, Highlander. Um, we are obviously aware of Toyota. Um, we've associated with them in the past and had good experiences, which has affected our perceived brand quality, and thus we're a little bit more loyal. Um, I feel like Toyotas last forever. They're, they're a good buy. Um, branding. So uh, individual branding is the strategy in which a firm uses to, uh, uses a different brand for each of its products. So um, individually, they brand their products. So it's not like some blanket thing. Um, the advantages of going individually is a problem with one of its products doesn't affect the uh, good name of the firm's other products. Uh, you see this a lot in pharmaceuticals. You have pharmaceutical, um, basically new drugs that come out, and each drug had its own brand. Uh, reason being is if that drug A doesn't work or B has some horrible side effects or something, it doesn't affect your other drugs. So um, that's individual branding. So different brands can be directed towards different market segments. Um, you can sell something to urology. You can sell something to cardiology. You can sell something to whatever if you're a pharmaceutical company and maintain an individual brand. Um, when actually, when I was a pharmaceutical rep, um, I would carry about two to three drugs in my bag at a time, but I'd usually only sell one at a time to protect the individual branding um, because I didn't want to get the doctor confused if one day I was coming in talking about something for, um, you know, heart health and the next day I'm coming in talking about men's health or women's health or something like that. So um, individual branding is very um, important when you have a pretty wide product mix and you want to insulate each other from that. So family branding is a strategy in which the firm uses the same brand for all of its, um, all or most of its products. The advantages of that, successful promotion for any one item carries the family brand, can help other products the same brand. Uh, new product has a head start with its brand name, uh, is already known, accepted by customers. Think of like McDonald's, um, that's a family branding, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, you know, they brand things like the Big Mac, um, but everything's under the Mickey D's logo. So if they come out with a new sandwich, everybody kind of automatically assumes, well, it's McDonald's, let's give it a try. So it would help it by being associated with the family. So brand extensions is using existing brand uh, to brand a new product in a, a different product category. Um, the example given is, is kind of obtuse, but it's West Elm as a furniture retailer um, recently partnered with DKK, a hospitality management firm, so think like hotels and stuff, to extend its brand into the boutique hotels. So um, you think about it, it's kind of smart for a furniture retailer to partner with a, a huge, you know, hotel, you know, uh, brand because hotels have to have furniture. So naturally furnished the West Elm furniture um, 
uh, inside the hotel rooms and inside the hotel. And then they also advertise, hey, you like this bed you're sleeping on? You can buy one just like it. So um, it's actually quite genius. Um, so marketers must be careful not to extend their brand too many times or extend it too far outside the original product category as either action may be weaken the brand. Um, if you fly any, um, there's always this little catalog in the seat back in front of you. And it's... Um, Sky Miles, um, or not Sky Miles, uh, what's that? Sky Mall, Sky Mall, and it'll have like the craziest stuff in there. It's just crazy. It's like that uh, one story you always see on Facebook, and they add, oh, what's that one that has the ads? You guys know what I'm talking about. It's like the crazy stuff. It's like, why in the crap that pop up on my timeline? You have to be very careful not to market too far um, to extend your brand. You can see that in Sky Miles, you can see that in Facebook ads. Uh, think something and all of a sudden boom it pops up as an ad is crazy so let's jump over to packaging packaging is all the activities involved in developing and providing container uh, with graphics for a product uh, it's actually a very diverse field um, until I went to Clemson I didn't realize it was a completely different major and then you could get a master's in like all these different functions um, it's crazy so what are the functions of packaging uh, protect the product, literally protect the product. Like if you're, if you're selling eggs, you want to be able to protect the eggs. Maintain the product's functional form. It's got to work. Um, offer consumer convenience. Um, is it something they can easily access? And to promote the product communicates features, uses, benefits, and image. Eggs are a great example. Been running the store um, a few times here of late and bought some eggs. I'm like, golly, brown eggs, white eggs, organic eggs, um, you know, <laughs> antibiotic free eggs free range eggs it's it's almost a little bit overwhelming so um there's so many features um and benefits that you have to almost do some research before you get there so um what are some design consideration for the packaging is you have to look at cost um again you're trying to make a profit here so you got to control your cost uh, is this something that's going to be packaged individually or with multiple units um, is there, are you, is your brand trying to use packaging to be consistent among the packaging designs? What's the promotional role of the packaging? Um, you know, what will trigger that consumer to pull your product over, uh, someone else's off the shelf? So, um, and then you also in this day and age are looking at environmental responsibility, something that, um, people don't feel terrible about buying. Like if it had a ton of plastic with it, what well, it might, you know, hey, it'll protect your product, but the cost is high, and then some people are going to get on to you about having a lot of waste in the landfill. Um, extension of um, packaging is labeling, it's the presentation of information on a product and its packaging. Um, the part of the label is the part of the package that contains information like brand name and mark, your trademark symbols. Um, you see the little uh, R with the circle here, that's a trademark symbol. So if you see like a name, you'll see that R behind it. Um, that's a trademark. So the package size and contents, product claims, directions for use and precautions, especially if you're talking about medicine, ingredients, if you're talking about food, name and address of the manufacturer, you have to be able to track that. And then a UPC uh, symbol, so your grocer or Walmart or whoever it is can be able to scan it. Um, so labels may also carry details of uh, written or express or warranties. What's an express warranty? It's a written explanation of the producer's responsibilities in the event the product's found to be defective or otherwise unsatisfactory. So that gives a little bit of peace of mind um, and also an ind indicator of quality for a consumer is if, they have, uh, if it has a warranty. So, what's the meaning and the use of price? Well, price, we're always familiar with that because we've been paying them since we could buy things. Price is the amount of money a seller is willing to accept in exchange for a product at a given time and under given circumstances. So, price serves the function of, of being an allocator. It allocates goods and services among those who are willing and able to buy them. So, if something's too expensive, you're not willing and able to buy it. But if you find something to be a good deal, you're willing and able to buy it. Uh, price allocates financial resources, um, i.e. sales revenue, uh, total revenue is price times quantity, so that price times how many somebody buys is the amount of revenue you get from that sale. So it allocates these founders resources among producers according to how well they satisfy customer needs. Um, if you ever bought something and felt ripped off, you don't buy it again. So that price does, did not reflect the quality of something you received. You ever bought something, you're like, man, that was great. I'm definitely going to buy that again. Same thing. Um, it satisfied your customer needs that time, so you're going to line up and get more. 
Uh, price helps customers allocate their own financial resources among various want satisfying products. Think about when you go to the store and you're like, hey, I want to spend about 50 bucks. You're kind of keeping a mental um, total of like, okay, I got about $35 in here plus tax. I'm looking at about 40. Um, I can buy maybe one more thing. That helps you allocate your financial resources, that mental accounting, and that's based on price. So price and non-price competition. Price competition is the emphasis on setting price equal to or lower than competitors' prices to gain sales and market share. It's um, literally competition based on price. Um, so it allows a marketer to set prices based on a product demand in response to changes in the firm's finances. So non-price competition is competition based on factors other than price. So um, nine times out of ten, it comes down to price. Um, however, sometimes you need to look at things like what's the product quality, what kind of customer service they have, is it flashy packaging, that type of thing. Um, to win a non-price competition, you better have some product differ differentiation. That's the process of developing, promoting differences between one's product and um, all similar products. Um, for example, um, I bought a Toyota truck. Um, I could have bought a Ford F-150 um, for a lot less money. But I felt like the quality and the life of the truck and the features of the truck were much better. Um, Toyota, I didn't buy it based on price. I mean, I'm trying to negotiate the price, but it wasn't the sole determinant. It was a non-price competition. And Toyota got to a point where they differentiated their product to a point that I knew that I wanted the Toyota Tundra. All right? Uh, product differentiation is very, very important when you're looking at non-price competition. Um, let's take, uh, let's, let's look at, uh, how do we price, um, the predominant, the prevailing, um, uh, form of pricing is cost-based pricing. Um, and it has a very simple methodology, uh, one, two, three here. The seller determines the total cost of producing or purchasing one unit. Um, so basically, Hey, how much does it cost us to make this car? Uh, the seller adds the amount uh, to cover the additional costs and the profit. So you put your profit in as a cost, and that's called your markup. It's the amount the seller adds to the cost of the product to determine its basic selling price. You take the cost of the product you're making, i.e. the car, and you add in how much profit you want to make. That's your markup, and that's the cost of the price. So um, the total cost plus the markup is the product's selling price. The cost involved in operating a business can be broadly classified and fixed into either fixed or variable costs. So fixed costs are costs that you're going to incur no matter how many units you produce. So it's rent, it's things like that. So um, whether you produce a single product today or not, you're going to pay the fixed cost. Um, it's rents, taxes, that type of thing. Variable costs are costs that depend on depending on how many units you produce. So if you produce more cars, you get to buy more rubber, you get to buy more steel, you get to buy more plastic, you get to buy all those things. So as you produce 30 versus 300, your variable cost at producing 300 is going to be much higher. Um, Cost-based pricing can be calculated uh, through break-even analysis. Um, so uh, basically, hey, I'm going to have this cost up front. I'm probably going to lose money up front. i got to get to a point where I break even, and then beyond that, I start making money. So the break-even quantity is the number of units that must be sold for the total revenue from all its units sold to equal the total cost of all the units. So the total revenue is the total amount received from sales or product, price times quantity, total cost is fixed cost plus variable cost. It's the sum of the fixed cost and the variable cost um, associated with the product. So... Um, Profit is total revenue minus total cost. So you want total revenue to be as big as you can, total cost to be as small as you can. And there's a, a neat little graph in the chapter that you can look at um, that says, hey, when you first start out, your cost can be really big, your revenue is going to be very small, so you're going to be at a loss. You're eventually going to get where these two things equal. And then eventually you're going to get in that sweet spot where the total revenue exceeds total cost. You're going to get as much as that as you can because that's called profit. So, New um, product pricing, price skimming, uh, it's a strategy of charging the highest possible price for a product during the introduction stage of its life cycle. So basically you're fishing. You're going to try to see what people are willing to pay for it, and you can always lower it. Penetration pricing, basically trying to bust up in a market. So basically you roll up in there at a low price for a new product and try to capture the market very quickly and then slowly turn up the temperature on the pricing. Um, 
So we talked about before differential pricing, negotiated pricing is establishing a final price through bargaining. That's negotiation. That's very popular in the new car market, used car market as well. Um, secondary market pricing, setting one price for a primary target and then um, a different price for another market. So um, you might have like a listed price and then, um, you know, you have a different price um, uh, for another market in that, okay, you go to a car dealership and you're looking at a new truck and they kind of walk you over to the used and say, hey, well, if you want to pay that, you got this over here. And what's funny is if you if you talk to them long enough, they'll walk you back over to the used and try to start giving you better prices over there. So they have secondary market pricing there as well. So per periodic uh, discounting, uh, temporary reduction of prices pattern on, or on a pattern or a systematic basis, i.e. holiday sales, um, Black Friday, that type of thing, seasonal sales. Um, random uh, discounting is a temporary reduction of prices on an unsystematic basis. So they have some kind of random sale. So periodic discount is like, hey, Labor Day sale, or day after Thanksgiving sale. Random is like, hey, man, like a flash sale, that type of thing. So um, almost done, folks. Just a few more slides. Um, psychological pricing, odd number pricing, strategy of setting prices using odd numbers are slightly below whole dollar, whole, whole dollar amount. So instead of saying, hey, something's $5, it's four ninety nine. dollars It makes you think you're getting a better deal. It's literally one penny less. Um, wow, it's in the fours. That's great. No, it's five bucks, man. They're just um, messing with you psychologically. So enjoy that. Multiple unit pricing, the strategy of setting a price for uh, two or more units. Example, um, you could buy, you know, a can of Coca-Cola for 50 cent. Um, but if you buy two cans, they're 99 cents. So I was like, wait a minute, that's a better deal, but buy a penny. So it's, it's tricking you again a little bit. Reference pricing, pricing a product at a moderate level and then positioning it next to a more expensive model and brand. That's, um, I used to do this when I was working for a company called Pennington C, where I sold a lot of lawn and garden um, products. I would take our moderately priced fertilizer and put it next to, uh, say, Scott's, like really expensive fertilizer, and watch my stuff fly off the shelves because they would buy, they would say, hmm, these two are right beside each other. They must be pretty much the same product, and they really were. And Scott's would be $30 a bag, mine would be $19.99, odd, odd number pricing. And I would sell a lot more because everybody's like, hmm, I'm saving like 10, 11 bucks here. Um, bundle pricing, packaging together two or more complementary products, selling them a single price. Example, there are telecommunication companies selling service bundles like cable, internet, and phone service all in one. That's charters kind of go to is the bundle. Um, everyday low prices, um, EDLPs, um, setting a low price of products on a consistent basis. That's where Walmart kind of made its bread and butter. Uh, Walmart, in terms of the everyday low price, has really been replaced by Amazon here late so uh, customary pricing pricing on the basis of tradition is just something that you're used to doing think of like Christmas tree farm hey this tall tree is always gonna be this etc etc um, getting there product line pricing captive pricing is pricing the basic product um, in a product line low but pricing related items high um, you know like a razor like if you go to like Target or something you can buy like a razor it's generally pretty cheap uh, but the daggum blades that you have to get like the replacement thing you can get like you know 10 of them in there and it's like 30 bucks um, so um, premium pricing is another thing pricing the highest quality or most versatile products higher than other models in the product line so um, you know it, you have premium pricing for like small kitchen appliances so um I was kind of shocked. Um, a few months back, came home, fr 